So, welcome to this session on Old Friesian and Middle Low German. And I will also talk a little bit about the Old Friesian Summer School. First, this is Frisia. So, this is where I'm from. And this is always what makes me feel homesick. Uh, so, a very flat landscape, as you can see. Here's a little dike, but that's all. Uh, greetings from, from a Frisian. Um, so today we will talk about Old Frisian, a little bit of the history and the geography, and then about Frisian as a Germanic language. So in many respects, Frisian sits in the family tree of Germanic languages between German and, and English. So that's true for modern Frisian, it's also true in, to a different extent for Old Frisian. So Old Frisian was always more connected to Old English, that is shifting through time, but okay. Uh, but it was also connected to Old High German. Then we will discuss the language shift to Middle Low German in certain parts of the Frisian area. And I'll tell you a little bit about the Old Frisian Summer School that's going to be held in July this year in St. Edmund Hall in Oxford. And that you might be interested in. Now the Frisians, it starts with a very sad story because they were described as a miserable people by the sea by Pliny the Elder. And he writes, twice every day and night the ocean flows over an immeasurable expanse and it remains doubtful whether this is land or sea. There a miserable people sit on high mounds built with their own hands, looking like sailors when the water covers the land and like shipwrecked people when the water has receded. This is describing the landscape before the dikes were built. So Frisia was very flat, bordering to the sea, and dikes were built by monks in the year 1000. But before that, of course, Pliny the Elder was a thousand years earlier, nearly a thousand years. Um, it would be a bit like this like this picture here. So there's some land, so a part of the land will uh, overflow by seawater, by ebb and flood every, well, twice every 24 hours. Um, in the summer, it will be a little drier. And the only way to live here is building a, sorry, building a tub. So if you, I think if you look at this church, it sits a bit higher up in the landscape. I hope you're able to see it. So if the landscape here, this flat grass, if it's covered in water, you can still sit dry if you are on top of the tub. If you look at the tub from an aerial point of view, you get this point of view. So you can see that the land is very flat. There are ditches to drain the water away. Uh, and, and that's it. And here on this little map you can see how many turps there used to be in the modern West Frisian area. So we have drawn on the map the modern West Frisian area and we can still find remnants of many of those turps. And those turps were sort of man-made mountains by, and also by living there the mountains grew higher through the generations. So people would dump their stuff there or build a new house on top of an old one and things like that. Um, so they would grow a bit higher and the highest turp is perhaps nine meters above sea level. It's not an enormous mountain, but it's all man-made. And it helped people to live and cope with the sea. Now Pliny is writing that even uh, those people are so miserable they live on the mud of that mountain and they dry the mud as well, more by the wind than by the sun, he says, um, to burn in their fire so they can heat themselves a little bit. And he says, since the land overflows twice a day, uh, they can't even hold cattle and even the fish flow away, uh, uh, flee away. So really miserable. Now, in old Frisian texts, that's the next slide, you also see this, this fight against the sea. 
So in the old skeleton uh, Riocht, it says, this is Riocht, that the Fria Freza, ne door fora an here veert verra, troch ban ne troch boot, dan mij da ebba oot en mij da floda op. So then not allowed, or they don't need to go any any way further uh, with the army on, on a campaign for the emperor. They don't have the obligation to go out further than they can come back within a day. And the reason for that is, Trug dan heet dat hij den ouwere waria skella, skel alle dagen jenst daar zal der zee en de jenst den wilda witsingers vloed. Mij vier wepenen, mij spade aan de mij vorka, mij skjode en de mij zwerde en mij etkris oorde. So he so shall defend his land against the salty sea. Well, ha- having seen the photographs, you can imagine why. Uh, and then they're, all, they're all also afraid of Vikings coming in. So also against the Vikings. And they needed to defend the land with spada and my furga, so with a spade and a fork, uh, so very much to build dikes or build dwelling mounds with a spade and with a fork. Uh, and if you encounter a Viking, you will need a sword or a spear. Now, where did the Frisians live before 800? Now, this whole uh, colored in area is the realm of Charlemagne around 800 or a little earlier and it's divided into three when his sons inherited it. Now that's all not so important. This shaded area, this is where the Frisians lived around 800. So not in Britain and not in Denmark. If we look a bit closer and 200 years later, we can see that the Frisians lived in this coastal area and also here up north. So around 800 or just after, uh, a whole bunch of Frisians emigrated to find somewhere better to live. I don't know whether it was better, it's full of islands here. And they were the North Frisians. They have developed their own language and their own dialect in a different way. To the extent that nowadays North Frisians and West Frisians cannot understand each other. So the, both languages, West Frisian and modern North Frisian, are not mutually intelligible. Now I have indicated the rivers here because they are very important and they appear in, in the text as well. So the most eastern, the easternmost one is the Weser, and that's where the old Frisian speaking area stopped. Then you have the Ems. Um, so the Ems nowadays is the border between North Germany and the north of the Netherlands. The Lauers is pop. Sorry, I'm pressing too much. The Lauers uh, is the river between the province of Frisia and the province of Groningen. And then the Flee indicates um, the river where until the year 1000 Frisian was spoken to the south of the Flee. But after the year 1000, that sort of ceased. And the Sinkval is nowadays the, the border between the Netherlands and Belgium. So before the year 1000, in that western coastal region, Frisian was spoken, but not after. Now you see the Frisian speaking area drawn on a more modern map. And as you can see here, do we have, uh, um, like here, in the middle here is uh, the province of Frisia nowadays. So West Frisian is spoken there. And to the right, um, upper right, you can see North Frisia. And as I said, it's not mutually intelligible. Then in between we have East Frisia. And East Frisia used to be Frisian spoken, but nowadays it's mostly Low German spoken. There is a very small area, three villages, 
Brahms law and Güter's law and another one in Zaterland and they have I believe 2,000 speakers but it's on its way out I'm afraid we do have a dictionary but it, it's on its way out and that's the only East Frisian that's left so people in northern Germany they will often say that they are still Frisians they might drink Frisian tea that the old Frisians never drank um, and they might feel a little bit Frisian but they are low German speaking on the whole and in West Frisia, you still have uh, 350,000 Frisian speakers. It's being taught in schools, uh, but it's a lot influenced by the Dutch language nowadays. Now, in between the province of Frisia, so the shaded area, and East Frisia, there you have the nowadays province of Groningen, so it's Dutch. And there, Frisian was spoken until about 1400. And after 1400, um, come in, come in. After 1400, the the low German influence was stronger than the Frisian influence, and that was for political reasons. Uh, so the city of Groningen in that area came under the Bishop of Utrecht, uh, and then in East Frisia they came under the Bishop of Bremen. And that made a lot of difference. That mean that also meant that those bishops sent out their charters and their writings in their own language. So the bishop of Utrecht would send out um, laws or regulations in a Dutch language, and in Bremen it would be more like German or Low German at the time. And that has influenced uh, the language no end. So the powerful layer in society, they were speaking a different language than Frisian. And I'm going to show a bit later how this language shift took place in the province of Groningen. And we can see it from some manuscripts that we still have. No, Frisian is part of the Germanic language family. You can see a family tree here. So we have Proto-Germanic, then we have East Germanic to the right, East Germanic, which is only Gothic, of which we have the Bible translation of Bishop Wolfila left, who translated that, I think, in 387, so in the 4th century AD, a very long time ago. So it's by far the oldest scripture in any Germanic language that we have. So and, and therefore it's very important. Then the North Germanic languages are nowadays the Scandinavian languages. And so Icelandic, Faroese, Norwegian, Danish and Swedish. And also directly split off from Proto-Germanic are the West Germanic languages. Now they split into two branches, so you have Anglo-Frisian here, and then you have uh, Dutch and German there. And under Anglo-Frisian you can see English and Frisian. So it's rather simplified here. <coughs> it doesn't mean, of course, um, that those languages, like English, Frisian and uh, Dutch and German, that they never were in contact. That's not true. That is the disadvantage of a model. A model always have sh has shortcomings. The model assumes that a language splits off and then never has any contact with any sister languages or with the mother language or whatever. Now, it, normal life is a bit more complex. So, yes, Frisian and English hail from an Anglo-Frisian ancestor, but there are also some arguments to think, well, in some ways, Frisian is closer to German. And how does that work? Again, the Old West Germanic languages. So the yellow shaded area is Old Frisian and Old English. Then you have Old Low Franconian, that's the green area, or Old Dutch, and Old Saxon. Now, Old Saxon is the forerunner of Low German. So Old Low German is normally referred to as Old Saxon. 
And in Old Saxon, we don't have so many scriptures, so many writings. We have the Heliant, which is um, an Evangelian harmony. A bit, a bit of noise outside. But, um, so we have the Heliant, and that's that's mainly it. And then the blue shaded area is the Old High German area. Now think of Old High German as an area where the second consonant shift has taken place. So if it's not shaded blue in this drawing, on this map, the second consonant shift has not taken place. So not in Old Saxon, not in Old Dutch, and not in Old Frisian and Old English. And that's a big difference. Now, Old Frisian. When do we talk about Old Frisian? So if we assume that West Germanic was spoken up till about 200 AD, and that we then, uh, people lived in um, tribes together uh, and language dialects would flow into one another. They, they would border to each other. Uh, it's rather difficult to say that there were many different languages. There, there were many different dialects called Ingvionic or North Sea Germanic. So around the North Sea, these dialects would be spoken. So around the North Sea, that includes the north of Germany, that includes uh, Frisia and the Netherlands, uh, and also Britain. So that's around the North Sea. And you will find some similar linguistic development in these languages. And then we go to common free proto or common Frisian up till 700. Now up till 700 all we have really is a few runic inscriptions. It's not very much. Uh, and for some runic inscriptions, it's even debatable whether they are Old Frisian or Old English. Of course, runic inscriptions are on a piece of bone, for example, or on an old comb. Um, and they're not pieces of text. They are single words. So that makes it harder to decide what they really are. And as you can see here, between 1100 and 1550, we have Old Frisian, split up in Old West Frisian and Old East Frisian. In this diagram, Old East Frisian is also split up again between Old Ems and Old Weser, but I think that's less important. Uh, the main important split is between Old West and Old East Frisian. Now, if you look at the time, it starts around 1100, the first manuscripts that we have in Old Frisian are some psalm glosses in 1190. These are really some texts. There are a few Old Frisian words in the Lex Frisionum um, from 802, issued by Charlemagne, uh, all written in Latin, but some words are translated into Frisian. These are just a very few words. So the main Old Frisian manuscripts start 1190 with some psalm glosses, interlinear glosses. And then uh, 1276 you have the Hunzing Home manuscripts. These are really the oldest ones. And then it gets later 14th century mainly and some 15th century. Now when you think of Old High German, Ottfried, Nordke, what sort of time are we thinking then? Like 800, 900? Um, so a lot earlier than Old Frisian. If you think of Beowulf, around the year 1000, that's Old English, earlier than Old Frisian. So why do we call this Frisian in this period that coincides with Middle English and it coincides with Middle High German, Middle Low German. Why do we call it Old Frisian? 
And the reason for that is that the linguistic forms in Old Frisian are still very old. Uh, we still have the full vowels in the second syllables in verbal endings. We still have the full vowels in noun endings. Uh, noun declensions, we have full vowels in the second syllable. And in Middle High German, also Middle Low German, uh, the second syllables have all weakened because the stress was no longer on the second syllable and they have all become schwas. So that makes a little a, a big difference between Old High German and Middle High German. It's the weakening of the full vowels in the endings. And that weakening hasn't happened in Old Frisian. That's why we call it still Old Frisian. Now, where does Frisian sit between English and, and German? Um, just a few examples to make this clear. In English, the sentence, who holds the key of the church? Is in Frisian, wa hat de kai van de kerke? In German, wer hält den Schlüssel der Kirche? And in Dutch, wie houdt de sleutel van de kerk? Now, there are several words to look at. Frisian and English are closest in these examples. So, who and wa both have an H in their spelling, which goes back to Old Germanic, and German and Dutch no longer have that. Then, the lexicon, ki and kai, are basically the same word etymologically in English and in Frisian. Whereas German has Schlüssel and Dutch Sleutel. So very different sort of word. So clearly not connected to each other in etymology. If we look at the last word that I've made bold, church, starts with a ch. Whereas in German, Kirche starts with k. And the same for Dutch Kerk. Now, the K is original, so the K was there in Proto-Germanic, but it has palatalized to a CH in English and also in Frisian. Now this is one of the main reasons to assume that English and Frisian both stem from one Anglo-Frisian ancestor. So the Anglo-Frisian Anglo hypothesis, like there was one ancestor for the two languages, is mainly based on this sound change that they both have in common. And then here another example, freezing between German and English. German and English both have the nasal drop before spirons. So in German, the word uh, guns, uh, the bird, Gans, uh, Dutch Gans, has an N, ends in N and S. And this N was dropped in English goose and goose and goose in Frisian. So the quality of the O is slightly different in Frisian, but it's also long. And what happens if the nasal is dropped before aspirant? There's also something like compensatory lengthening. So goose is fairly long, and goose in English and goose in Frisian is even a diphthong. Now, tu and twa are spelled nearly the same, uh, just like twee in Dutch. And in German, we have zwei. Now, German here has had a sound change that neither that none of the other three languages have had. Does anybody know which one it is? Second consonant shift. Heard of the second consonant shift or uitgehoord Deutsche loud for Schiebel. So the T at the beginning has moved to uh, T. So it has become a fricative. 
And that only happened in High German, it did not happen in Low German. Now here again you can see some examples where the palatalization has taken place in Frisian and English, also in cheese and cheese, versus German Käse and Dutch Kaas, uh, Church and Cherke, as we discussed, and then also the G at the end, at the word end, can be palatalized after a high vowel. A high vowel is an E or an E, or E or E. So it's in the front of your mouth, and the duck, tag, um, gets palatalized to de in English and day in Frisian. So it's no longer a g but a y. And yeah, goes and guns we discussed. So the nasal drop before spirals. Then there are also some word order questions. So in the syntax you can see differences. And in this example, Frisian and German are the same versus Dutch. Dutch is different. So um, in German you would say, uh, uh, er sagt, dass der Friseur die Haare gut geschnitten hat. You couldn't say, dass der Friseur die Haare gut hat geschnitten. That's wrong. So that's why I have marked it with a star. The same in Frisian, that the kapper min hier goed knipt had. And that is the only order that's allowed. Whereas in Dutch you can say, dat de kapper mijn haar goed geknipt heeft, of goed heeft geknipt. That's both possible, and both acceptable. And also both uh, still in use. And in English, that the hairdresser has cut my hair well, the order is slightly different again. And also here, Friesen and German have the same word order. Dat het mooi waar wird is heel, or dat es schön as wetter werden wird. And in Dutch, dat het mooi weer worden zal, is rather old fashioned. It is not something that anybody still uses. It's possible, but mm, not very much. And the other order, in Dutch, that het mooi weer zal worden, that's the normal order. Uh, that same order zal worden, zal worden, wird werden, is not possible in Frisian or in German. So that shows that those languages are close and have different things in common. Now, something interesting between Frisian and English, another reason to assume uh, the Anglo-Frisian hypothesis, is that English and Frisian both have irregular plurals. Like call K, uh, in English that's cow, and used to be kine. Kine is an old plural for cows. An English sheep, plural sheep, is the same. And also in Frisian, skip, skip. And goes, gears, and nowadays gozen in Frisian, and in English, goes, gears. And then the word for bern, bern, child, or children, is the same in singular and plural. And in some Scottish dialect, I believe, there's some. The, some people still, still say barn for, for children or child or, or children. So in, in dialects it still appears. And now in child is the common word, but that's a different matter. Now the question is, does this similarity between Old Frisian and Old English uh, prove that they were an an Anglo-Frisian, one Anglo-Frisian ancestor? Or does it not? Does anybody have an idea? 
Can you use that as a proof or can you not? Can I see some hands? Who thinks that you cannot use it as a proof? Okay, I see a, a couple of hands. So who thinks you can use it as a proof? I also see another couple of hands, different hands. Right, so um, the opinion is divided in the room here. And I would say these irregular plurals, they, they hail from the older language, from Proto-Germanic. They've been lost in German. But if you retain something old, an old form, in a later stage of the language, that doesn't prove that the languages are more closely related. It only proves that they have retained the same um, phenomenon. But it's not necessarily a proof for the Anglo-Frisian hypothesis. Of course, it does show that they were close, but does it show that they were closer than they were to Old High German? Well, perhaps not, not really, because they have just retained something old that Old High German has not retained. Now, Henry Sweet already came up with the old, uh, with the Anglo-Frisian hypothesis. Um, I, wo I won't spend too much time on that. And Patrick Stiles, unfortunately, has proven that, um, yeah, that there are too many sound changes that Frisian has in common with German to really be sure that there was one Anglo-Frisian ancestor. So that was Styles. Now I will show a few examples of where Old Frisian goes either versus all the, the other three languages or they, they go in different ways together. So if you look at the verbs in Old Frisian, a biada, beaten, it, does, it has lost the N. So in Proto-Germanic it was budan, uh, the N has been kept in Old English, Old Saxon and Old High German and it's been lost in Old Frisian. And all infinitives in Old Frisian have no N. So Old Frisian is the only one there with that phenomenon. Now the past participles of verbs in Old Saxon and Old High German has a pre have a prefix G. So, ki biodon in Old Saxon and ki biotam in Old High German. And Old Frisian and Old English have a change in common, so it's a common innovation, and that does bring them together because it's a common innovation. And they have no prefix. So, beden and bodan. Um, in the verbal system, Old Frisian, Old English and Old Saxon are on one side when it comes to the, the, the plural uh, formation, so versus Old High German. So these three languages all have one form for the whole plural, a uniform plural. So f in Old Fri Frisian, Fahrrad, uh, so for we, for you plural, it's Fahrrad, and for they plural, it's also Fahrrad. Whereas in Old High German, there are three different forms, Fahren, Fahrrad, Fahrend. Now, Old English and Old Frisian go together versus Old High German and Old Saxon. When it comes to vowel breaking, so breaking between means that a short vowel becomes a diphthong. And we see that in Fechtan, Old High German, Old Saxon. And in Old Frisian it's Fjorta. And in Old English, Fjorta, to fight. And here Old English and Old High German go together versus Old Frisian and Old Saxon. When we look at the word for this in Old English is this with a Z in Old High German. 
whereas in Old Frisian and Old Saxon, hence also in, in Low German, it ends in a T. So in Low German, it's still dit, uh, or still dot. It still ends in a T. And then the first person singular of the verb to be is bim and bem in Old Frisian and Old High German, where it is, um, there's some sort of breaking in Old English and Old Saxon in bium. And another example, Old Frisian Rieke, is Rieke, um, Reich, uh, or Rich. And old, in Old High German, it's Rieke, need the K has changed to G, as a consequence of the second consonant shift. And in Old English, Rieke, the K has become a Ch, as a consequence of palatalization. Now we go to some sources. So how do we know about Old Frisian? We have manuscripts. This is the first Hunzingho manuscript. Um, it's early 14th century, or some say late 13th century. And the third Emzingho manuscript. It looks pretty as well. And here we see a little map about where you can find the different manuscripts. So can you see those little circles? The little circles, they indicate places where certain manuscripts uh, have, uh, are, are from. So this is West Frisia, the certain manuscript there, like Unia and Roda and Brug and some others. Then in the Groningen and Ommelanden, we have Huntingho, that we've just seen, and Hippogo, and then we have the East Frisian manuscripts, which is Emzingho and Rustringen, and the most to the right, the most eastern one, is also the most archaic one in language forms. Hails back to 1327 is the Rustring manuscript, and it's, it's kept in Oldenburg. Now, interestingly, in the Rustring manuscript, we see some low German loans. So it's written in Old Frisian, but because of its geographic location, you can see that it, it could have been influenced by low German. And it was middle low German at the time, not old, because of the time difference. So one example is the word hiri that we find very much in the Rustring manuscript. Hiri is related to Old High German here, uh, which means army, and it's, it's used quite a lot in hiri folk and hiri feert and uh, many more words starting with hiri. Now, what we find in Low Saxon is not an e, not hiri, but her or heri. So, if you find a form with her, it must have been borrowed from Old Saxon. And this is what we find in the Rustring manuscript. There is one word, hertoga, her, herzog. Uh, it doesn't have an I there, it has an R. So it must have been borrowed from Old Saxon Heri Togo. Another example is the word Kind. In Old Frisian it would be Bern or Bern, but in the Rustring manuscript we find Kind. That's not Frisian at all, so that also must have been borrowed from German and most likely from Low German, not from High German, because it didn't border to the High German-speaking area. And another um, example is Peter. Peter is a name, Peter. Uh, and in High German it would be Peter, with a T in the middle. But the lenition, the T becoming a D, that's very typical 
for Middle Low German. And this is also what we find in the Rustring manuscript. Whereas in other old Frisian manuscript, Peter with a T is found. And of course the, the word Peter, because it's a biblical name, um, will appear I in manuscripts when it's about Christian background. Now it's, this is the same picture again, so the same map, uh, but now look at the Fivoho manuscript, it's in the middle. And this Fivoho manuscript is in the area, was written in the area that changed to Middle Low German first. So you can you can see the manuscript, yeah this is the manuscript and it was written in 1427 um, and then in that time the strange thing was the language had changed to Middle Low German the language of writing, uh, the language of administration, but the legal system was still Old Frisian. So the laws needed to be written down, the laws were Old Frisian and they needed to be written down, hence they needed to be translated. And in these translations you can find some interesting things. So between the river Lauers and Ems, so the, the nowadays province of Groningen, there was a language shift around 1400, from Frisian to Low German. And there are about 200 manuscripts, Low German manuscripts from the region that were originally translated from Old Frisian. Of course, what happened, there, a, a few translations were made and then these translations were copied and the copies were copied as well. So you can see lots of changes over the manuscripts. And if we compare different readings from these manuscripts, and then here we have the word, we have Sa'achi then to na alla ruchta thing. Does he ought to know or to testify all legal provisions? That's what we find in the Fivogo manuscript, so in Old Frisian. Then we get phonological adaptation. So, ought he dan to weten alle rechten? That is Middle Low German. And I could not find the word Ochet in the Old Saxon Dictionary. I don't know if anybody has heard of it. No. Does he and then Ochet? And I wonder how much Middle Low German speakers were able to understand that. Did they know what it meant? Or is it just the phonological adaptation from A with an A to an O, which is more common in, in Middle Low German? So they've kept the same sort of word, uh, didn't quite understand it, so they, uh, they adapted it in a phonological sense, but then failed to fully understand it. And another manuscript has given a translation of A, so Geboort hem to weten alle rechten. Geboort hem, uh, like it suits him, he, he, he has to know all the laws. So, and that is proper, that's a proper translation because that's proper Middle Low German. And here is another example. That alle Ramona leek sin as eines broeke and walde. So that everyone, uh, his own inherited land that is, might use and govern. Like in modern German, walten, verwalten. But that was not really used anymore in Middle Low German. So it says walde and the besitten and the broeken. So did it mean wanted to possess and use? And then that's how it has become in the translation, not Wolde and the besitten, but Wolde besitten and the opbrücken. So clearly 
Wang has been translated as an auxiliary. So we had a language shift took place because of political reasons, as I said. Um, okay. So there was the Bishop of Utrecht governing over Groningen and the Bishop of Bremen governing in East Frisia. So this had a major influence on the writing system. Now I will say a few words about the Old Frisian Summer School now, yeah. but so far are there any questions? All baffled. Good. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> so if you wanted to learn any more about Old Frisian uh, and know more about the text and uh, what it means to learn to, to know Old Frisian, if you, are, if you were interested in comparing Old Frisian to other Old Germanic languages, then you'd be very welcome to come and take part in the Old Frisian Summer School. I have some flyers there, so you can take one home and think about it. In 2019, we had the first summer school and it was great fun. So we had some lectures, we had some workshops, we had a conference dinner, and we went out Printing on a Saturday on the last day, so that was good. We could have the summer school because we have proper handbooks nowadays. So there's a grammar, and there's a there's a dictionary, and also the handbook, uh, Handbuch des Friesischen, Handbook of Friesian Studies. In addition, we have digital resources for Old Friesian, so ten digitized manuscripts that you can find online, and here's the link. Uh, and uh, Rita van der Poel has entered many old Frisian texts into a database, a searchable database. So can you read it here at all? Um, so I was looking for the word spada, and again comes up, spada is in the middle, and you can see a few words before and a few words after. And you can also tell which text it is in. You can click on it, and then you can can go through to the whole text. So she has entered the critical editions of the old Frisian text into this database, which is a great help. It is really good. Right. Yeah. Thank you very much for your attention, and don't forget to to uh, take a leaflet.